living on an island such as St. Martin, surrounded by the mighty Atlantic Ocean, hurricanes are common. This is a painting done by one of my very good friends, Mr. Jimmy Lucero, depicting one such hurricane. In the year 2017, in the month of September, we had a Category 5 hurricane called Hurricane Irma. My wife, our dog, and myself, and most many other people here, were witness to this storm. She has such a power in her that I thought I should compose a poem in her name. And this is what the poem was about. This is one of the stanzas from that, Reflections to the Eye of Irma. There she came, Irma was her name, with all her might and fury, her head, eye, and entire frame. She twisted and tossed cars, boats, trucks, and trees, everything that came in her way, doors, windows of tapestries, and everything, shattering the treasured memories of us all, of years in the past, of everyone, big and small. Like I said, she was very powerful. Even today we see her footprints, we see her fingerprints on every single beach, every single wall and floor and tree of the island. However, the people of this island are so resilient that within two years, most of the island is recovered. Moreover, what people learned is that hurricanes are inevitable, but we need to make our houses hurricane-proof. I am not here today to talk about those external natural disasters. But I'm talking about today disasters that will occur in our mind due to stress and how we can make our minds hurricane-proof. And I'm going to briefly talk about the neurological basis behind that. And when I think about a person who was a model to me in terms of coping up with stress, it brings my memories to my mother. She was a personification of joy and laughter. She did not have ideal life at all to begin with. She lost her parents at a very tender age, and in fact, she did not even remember their faces. And therefore, she was in a, raised in an orphanage with all the problems that were associated with that. Later on in life, problems still continued. She developed rheumatoid arthritis and various other physical ailments, but even then she continued smiling and became a personification of laughter to us. Despite her rheumatoid arthritis, due to which she could not travel like us physically, through the lens of her imagination, through the lens of her learning, geography, history, and literature, she took us along, showing us the world through that. She made our nest of mind hurricane-proof. She taught us how to make our nest hurricane-proof. In fact, let me take you a few steps forward. A few minutes ago, before I came in here, in fact, just now, I took a peek into the audience. I said to myself, oh my God, what have I signed up for? Instead of being on a beautiful beach out there on a Sunday morning, I'm here, I'm getting palpitations right now, sweating, throbbing in my chest. I felt like crying like a baby. Oh my goodness. But I wish I could cry. But then I thought, you know what? The better strategy is don't cry. You are not getting the palpitations and throbbing because of fear and anxiety. You like being in the public, talking about whatever concept you want to. So it's excitement, not fear. See? How we can cheat our mind the same physiological response of palpitation and throbbing in the chest, which could be caused by fear. No, no, you can tell your mind, no, my dear, don't cry. This is fun. See? Same thing probably holds good to our taking examinations. Let me take you to an interesting experiment that psychologists did in Canada called the famous Capilano Bridge Experiment. And essentially, this is a, this is a bridge in Vancouver which runs across a river. It's very, very high level there. And owing to be, being a fact that it's a suspension bridge, it keeps swinging left and right, left and right when there's heavy wind. So when you're walking across the bridge, naturally you get a fear as though you're going to fall. You're going to have palpitations and all that. 
So here is here we have psychologists basically were studying uh, several male adults, tourists, who were walking across the bridge, and they were approached casually by an attractive female psychologist. So now when they saw her, they started attributing the palpitations and throb in the chest, instead of attributing it to fear of falling in the river, they started feeling attracted towards her. And many of them, believe me, started dating with her or tried to date with her. See how mind can cheat us? So even before the mind can cheat us, probably we should be able to cheat our mind, at least sometimes. Talking about stress, we could get acute stress or chronic stress. Typically acute, something unexpected, a shocking news, lost your job, lost someone you loved a lot, acute. Chronic is more prolonged, too many deadlines to work on, preparing for exams continuously, that's a big one. A neurosurgeon working on his operations, which can go from 10 to 12 hours, and maybe twice a week, and for many years, could have a chronic stress. Don't take me wrong, stress is not bad, they say. As long as we are equipped, trained to work with it, it's beneficial. It's the allostasis. But when it goes beyond, that's where the problems come, and they manifest in the form of what are called as burnout syndromes, where one could get things like fatigue, la lack of appetite, problem with sleep, sometimes drugs, maybe as time goes by, maybe immunodeficiencies, and so on and so forth, immunocompromise, and we could have various other issues associated with that. Now, in terms of the physiological mechanisms behind stress, there are two types, acute and chronic, like we said before. Typically, when you talk of acute stress, it has to be quick, swift, rapid, and it can be only brought about through something like autonomic nervous system, as they call it, uh, the sympathetic mechanism, and the top of all that is hypothalamus. So when there is a stressful situation, like say, I am driving a car on a highway, all of a sudden a biker cuts me off. I suddenly get anxious. I may even get angry. This was adrenaline that did that work on me. Whereas a chronic stress is more prolonged over a period of time. I am going through highways time and again to reach my work. The work may be exciting, but then every single day it takes two hours instead of half an hour. Oh my God, it's going to be boring, boring, boring. That is brought about through corticosteroid mechanism, or steroids as they call. That is chronic. Now, fortunately for us, whether it's acute stress or chronic stress, we have a feedback mechanism, a regulatory func mechanism, by means of which we tone down, the body tones down the stressful responses. So we don't exhaust our steroids, or we don't have too much of steroids in our circulations, Either of these could be a problem. And hypothalamus is one of those centers through which the feedback regulation is brought about. We also have feedback mechanisms going all the way up to cerebral cortex, right here, right underneath the skull, through which we are able to tone down our stressful responses, provided we have trained the brain enough. Now, talking about cerebral cortex, typically neurobiologists talk about the left brain, or the left cerebral cortex, and the right brain, right cerebral cortex. Left brain, also called the language area of the nervous system of the brain, is predominantly associated with things like calculations, learning a concept, working on your finances, preparing for your exams, left brain. Whereas right brain is predominantly associated with, which is also called the non-dominant hemisphere, associated with things like laughter, Music, painting, raising a pet, all those things are softer side. They are the right brain activities. The more I use my left brain, the more the connections occur there, and that's called neuroplasticity. And in fact, the volume of the brain increases. It's a well-known thing. Similarly, the more I use my right brain, it's the neuroplasticity in my right brain, and the volume of the right brain increases. Now, what happens in our day-to-day -day life? Typical. As a medical student, I remember preparing for exams, try to read all type of resources, do the practice questions, do all these things day in and day out, stay, stay late up to night, not having food, exercise, nothing. What's happening? My left brain is, of course, engaged quite a lot. And I'm feeling, maybe in, in initially I was feeling quite happy, but then, over a period of time, I started feeling 
a burnt down phenomenon. Oh my God, I'm not enjoying my course any longer. Slowly I started doing music, learning Bollywood songs, okay, and then joining Humor Club. I, rem I started laughing in my life. Then I started enjoying my career. Why? Because right brain is also now getting neuroplasticity. And interestingly, there's an irony here, which many of us don't realize. The right brain has a greater control on our emotions than the left brain. Why? During neurodevelopment, it's the right brain that gets that's developed first before the left brain, and therefore it has a greater connection with the hypothalamus and the various other structures that are associated with emotion control. And what has happened? Ironically, we do not use the right brain as much. Well, there's one more domain, physical activity. Maybe yoga, maybe running, maybe going to the gym every day, whatever. Any form of physical activity, eventually what happens, it brings about, it enhances the neuroplasticity in both the left and the right brain. The question is, am I doing enough physical activity? And I feel so happy when I see students in the gym every morning. Wow, you're preparing for exams much better than probably staying out in that one hour in the morning. That being said, what happens when we engage ourselves in terms of physical activity or laughter or any sort of engagement? We have various chemicals that are released. One such well-known thing is dopamine, which is released in the brain. There's a surge of this chemical substance. Similarly, we can have what are called as endorphins. And why are they called endorphins? Because they are like morphins, but they're released within our cells. We don't need to inject morphine. It is released in quite a good quantity whenever we engage ourselves in these type of activities. Similarly, we have cannabis-like chemicals, again released from inside. They're called endocannabinoids because they're released from inside again whenever we engage ourselves in these type of activities. And what do these do? They make us feel blissful or happy. And that's why, in fact, one of them is called anandamide. Ananda in Sanskrit is bliss. Not only that, they bring about neuroplasticity, activation and increased network in the brain. An interesting study that was performed, in fact, very recently, very elegant study was where they did, did what is called the positron emission tomogram or PET scanning by means of which we can study in an individual as someone is doing something, you can study the various chemicals that are released. In fact, subjects were watching comedy show, half an hour episodes, along with their friends on a TV. And you know what? There's a surge of endorphins in the brain. Now, endorphins are known to bring about neuroplasticity, yes. But now, we also know that endorphins that are released here also increased these subjects, their thresholds for pain also increased. So not only were they feeling happy, because of it's a comedy show, of course, you don't want to cry there, but then, along with that, there was increase in threshold to pain. Further, we know that endocannabinoids, in fact, also prevent, to some extent, or postpone probably development of degenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Lastly, giving in a nutshell, I want to use my right brain once again because I want to know, I know that it's very important. So I have a poem here which gives in a nutshell what I've said so far. And I basically call it Tempering the Tempest. Where the dawn begins after a good night's sleep with stretching, skipping and a short run pet alongside a companion, some music and some fun, small sips of water and good nutrition, magical fountains of endorphins and cannabinoids flow, neurons make new connections and synapses grow, tempering our tempests and stress responses low. What is even more, the journey of life will no longer be of tiring, never-ending burnout and monotony. It will be an adventure of turns, twists, ups and downs, of deserts and green meadows and enchanting town. And finally, it reminds me of my lovely granddaughters who ev every day when I do WhatsApp mess talking with them, they remind me, Grandpa, please do not forget to laugh. <laughs>